Well, thank you for the nice introduction. Okay, here's the Beamer. Well, as you already said, my name is Sasha Palmberg. I'm originally from Dortmund, and I live in Taiwan. This is uh, right in front of the Taipei 101, the former tallest building in the world, which is Al Khalifa uh, in, um, uh, in Dubai. So, um, well, I moved to Taiwan roughly about five years ago because I've been working in the industry, and I would just love to tell you my story, how I really made it. So the question is, in general, how can someone who barely survived high school, who never studied, um, make it over to Taiwan and meet all of these amazing people that you will see on the next picture? <laughs> and who can constantly make it when there's any huge tech show into the primetime news? And um, who is also capable of running a bunch of speeches and going to conferences. I think like, I'm in Germany for the last two weeks and I did roughly about six or seven speeches. And who can also travel the world in a way that I would never ever have imagined, which is basically on the next slide. Um, these are my four square logins from the last 12 months, which is roughly about 250,000 miles of traveling the globe. Well, it's basically because of technology. I'm a geek, I love technology. And um, this is my bag. Well, at least when I'm unboxing it. So this is, um, these are the devices that I'm constantly traveling with when I'm going to a new show. I'm constantly trying out new devices. So technology really helped me to live this lifestyle because that's not a job. Trust me, you can't do it as an ordinary job and as an ordinary employee. But there's also something else that gets combined with technology, and this is about information and that information wants to be free. And not only it wants to be free, it also wants to be shared. So roughly about 12, 14 years ago, I had a key moment in my life where I asked myself, what is going to inspire me to do good to the world, to change something, to make a difference? And um, in 2002, I stumbled upon a project from India. It's called um, The Hole in the Wall. This was created by a computer scientist in New Delhi. So he was just running an experiment. We are into experiment, as you can tell by the former talk. Um, he just put a high-speed computer that was connected to the internet into a wall, which site was facing a slum of New Delhi. And then he was just watching what's going to happen. What is going to happen if you provide kids with a free high-speed computer and a free internet access? people and kids that never ever had the chance to connect to the internet, to get connected to information. Well, it just took a couple of hours. Those kids figured out how to open up a browser, how to get onto Disney.com and watch Mickey Mouse movies over there. But what's even more interesting is, the next day, they kind of created mentors in this community. That means other kids were teaching the next wave of kids have just stumbled upon this, how to use this device. So it's really interesting and very, very inspiring for me. Well, the next project I stumbled upon was back in 2004. In 2004, the IT industry roughly sold a billion PCs, notebooks, into the Western markets. And they tried to figure out these unsaturated markets. What are we going to do next? Where can we sell the next one billion PCs? And everybody was talking about emerging markets. But no one really could afford a PC in India. Well, if you have an annual income of $1,000, you won't be able to buy a computer for $800. So that's where the old PC project started. This was started by Nicholas Negroponte at the MIT. Um, and he was talking about a $99 computer, a $99 notebook, a $99 notebook that gets into the hand of each and every child in this world, which was completely, you know, out of this horizon that the traditional computer industry set for themselves. Because an average notebook was more than 1,200, 1,300, 1,400 bucks at that time. So a $99 PC. And that was the old PC project, one laptop per child. And they actually started it. And they started to ship this in 2006. And they shipped roughly about a million units um, of this device right now. So um, I've been working in the IT industry at that time. I've been creating motherboards, very boring stuff, to tell you that. 
I've been creating cases for computer, designing them. I've been doing system architecture. I've built tablets before the iPad came out. And sooner or later, I just said to myself, yeah, finally, you need to get to the core of all of this, of all of this industry, which was Taipei in Taiwan. So I finally moved over um, to Taipei in February 2009, after being there like each and every year for at least four or five times. Taiwan is, is a beautiful country. It's a little island in, the Southeast, in Southeast Asia. Um, they have an amazing city with Taipei, roughly about six million citizens. They have amazing temples, and they have amazing beaches, which is also very nice. I'm not so sure. I think, unfortunately, they also have amazing food because I gain a lot of weight over there. That's my favorite food. Um, that's the beef noodle soup. It's very traditional. It's actually, it's almost like a beef soup in, in, in Germany, just with some thicker noodles in it. It's absolutely delicious. But what they also have, they have technology. Um, one of the biggest, or a bunch of the biggest brands in technology are coming from Taiwan. You, you see Asus over there, D-Link, uh, Enamax, Gigabyte, HTC, of course, when it comes to mobile technology. And so roughly about 80% of the devices that we're using in consumer electronic at least have one component in there that comes from this little island in Southeast Asia. But they also have a pretty cool infrastructure. So this is the so-called MRT train. This is all computer-driven. Uh, um, that's the train that I'm taking to the office each and every day for about eight or nine kilometers. It only costs me like 40 cents because it's heavily subsidized over there. You're paying with an NFC card, which is also pretty cool, so you don't need any cash money. Everything is getting paid wirelessly. And at each and every MRT station, they have this setup over there. So this is a little stand where you can place your notebook and we charge it. But not only a notebook next to the power outlet, is also a USB connector, so you can recharge your smartphone. And of course, you have free Wi-Fi all over Taipei, which is a must. So basically, what I'm doing, and this is actually the header of my Facebook profile, is basically saying that the future belongs to the geeks, because no one else wants it. Because geeks are building our future. And it's not only the Bill Gates or the Mark Zuckerberg of the 21st century or the 20, late 20th century, we can even look back like 100 years. There's a very, very nice article from Nikola Tesla, which was one of the biggest geeks ever. Um, he wrote an article in the magazine for Popular Science in 1909, where he basically predicted the BlackBerry, like 100 years before the BlackBerry came to the market. He was talking about a device that fits into the palm of your hands, and a businessman that is traveling somewhere in London, is just instantly submitting an article or a text that he's typing on this device to his office in New York, which is quite interesting. But what technology really does, and this is what I'm truly believing in, technology can change the world for the good, and it can change the world for children. This is a slide of a talk that I used to give for developers all over the world. I've been telling them that low-budget uh, low devices, inexpensive tablet computers, will be the most disruptive devices of this decade. These kids, those are the kids I've been talking um, about before. Those are the ones that can't afford an iPad. They can't afford an iPhone. But you can buy $30 or $35 tablets in India or in China. And it's quite interesting what, how important these devices are for them, because basically, such a tablet is their first computer. It's also their first ebook reader. And it's also their first smartphone. They've never had a smartphone before. It's even going to be their first TV. And it's also their first radio. Their first gaming console, very, very important. And last but not least, uh, obviously, the most popular component in a mobile device, it's going to be the first camera that gives them the chance to kind of take pictures and videos of their environment and to share it with other people. And this was one of the main reasons why I founded Mobile Geeks back in August 2012. And now we're coming back to this one slide 
or you're wondering, what is this guy doing? I'm constantly writing about these latest devices. So whenever I travel, I have a bunch of smartphones, tablets with me. I'm reviewing them. I'm talking to the developers and the engineers of these companies. And I'm giving them some, some updates, what I like and what I hate about it. Actually, I'm telling them a lot about what I hate. Because uh, I still think that, I mean, we're living in the 21st century. Why do you want to build average products? Why do you want to actually build shitty products? There are shitty products out there. I don't have time for shitty products. So I'm publishing all of this. And I'm making money by publishing all of this for free. Just to give you an idea, I started on my own about seven years ago. I had $500, started my first blog. In the first 12 months, I roughly made around 160,000 euros from scratch which was pretty cool. Um, I left my job in the US at that time. I also lost my working permission due to this. And um, my parents weren't so delighted by this because I had to move back into their house for three months. Um, I also wasn't so delighted by this. Well, at least after some two or three weeks. Um, and then I moved to Taiwan. And now we're running a company of 10 people. I have five employees in Taiwan. I have three employees over here in Germany, two in the US, a freelancer in Beijing that is, he, she's writing for us, and we roughly create a, a revenue, an annual revenue of 500,000 US dollars. And we're doing this with free content. And it's because I believe in the culture of sharing. I think sharing is a very, very important asset of mankind. Uh, yes, we can talk a lot about culture, and actually I, I took this from Wikipedia, Right? And you can all look it up, what culture really means to you. But here is the interesting part. Um, I hated Latin in school. Um, it almost broke my neck, basically. I had it like for six or seven years. But at least I know whether what culture is coming from right now, and I can show off a little bit what I learned at school at that time. So, uh, cultura comes from the word cholera, and it basically means to cultivate, to inhabit, or to admire. But what's even more important, it means to care. So there's an interesting phrase in the world of social networks and in the world of sharing, which basically says, sharing is caring. Yes, that's exactly what it is. And um, you won't believe who is showing up on the next picture. That's me. Um, that is roughly about 32 years ago, um, where I still lived in a world where I thought, you know what, every little good that you're getting, you kind of need to protect it. It's yours, right? I don't really want to share it. It was all about mine, mine, mine. And this is what the next slide will tell you. I've always had problems when someone else was stepping into my place. <laughs> and I always felt disturbed when someone wanted to take something away from me that was supposed to be mine which makes no sense, because our societies are based on sharing. There are so many different markets, economies, that created due to sharing, whether we're sharing food with each other, we're sharing a car, the car sharing economy is growing massively each and every year. We're sharing bikes. I'm not so sure if they're doing this in, in Münster, because I believe everyone has one. Um, and of course, we're also doing file sharing. We're all doing file sharing constantly, and we're sharing data. And when you look at these companies, these are some of the biggest companies that are existing right now. Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, Instagram, YouTube, couldn't work at all without the culture of sharing. If no one would share their data, a picture, a status update, or whatever to Facebook, Facebook wouldn't exist at all. But we're also going to share knowledge. We're doing this for quite a while. My background is, um, was involved in the open source community because I believe in open source software. And when you look at these companies and then these projects right now, whether it's Android, where an open source software became the most popular and the most successful operating system in the world. An operating system that changed the way we are using mobile devices. Or think about WordPress that gave me the chance to blog and write about my, my devices, my travels, and everything. Or think about the browser like Firefox. That's all open source. 
and pretty much the coolest example of them all when it comes to sharing is Wikipedia. How cool is that? That we have the wisdom of mankind on one platform for free just because other people are sharing it with us for free. No one is getting paid for this. This is a non-profit organization, and it's absolutely amazing, especially over here in Germany. I think um, German is the second or third most popular language on Wikipedia. But we can also learn from the wisdom of the crowd, and this is Sir Francis Galton, and he was talking about the crowd wisdom already 100 years ago. And at the beginning of the last century, he uh, went to a fair, a country fair, and he made an experiment about um, that all these people that were attending this fair had to guess the weight of this ox that you saw earlier. So 800 people actually participated in this, and um, they guessed the weight of 1,197 pounds, and the actual weight was 1,198 pounds. It just tells you a little bit about the power of sharing, about the power of sharing knowledge and wisdom, and also about the power of doing this for free. So when you're leaving TEDx, I actually want all of you guys you know, to go out there to share at least a little bit and do it for free and help to make the world a better place. Because at the end, sharing is still caring. Thank you.